to be in Leviticus chapter 17 tonight, and I am going to be talking about the blood of Messiah. And if ever you're going to talk about blood, you need to go to Leviticus, because it's all about sacrifices, right? Mm -hmm. Amen. All right. What I want us to specifically look at tonight is blood from a biblical perspective, okay? Now, we all know that we have a great hope, and that great hope that we have is everlasting life or eternal life, correct? That's our hope. That should be our hope. That should be what we're all striving for is eternal life, okay? And every one of us, Scripture says, should be able to give a reason for the hope that is within us. However, I do not believe that there is a man upon the face of this earth who can give a reason for hope beyond the grave who is a stranger to the blood of Messiah. Amen. Let's look at Leviticus 17. We're only going to read one verse. Verse 11. One eight, would you be kind enough? For, a, for the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for yourselves. For it is the blood that makes atonement because of the life. Okay. Now, so let's take a look at blood from a scriptural basis and see how it ties in to the blood that Messiah shed for us. Okay? What does Scripture say about blood? Does anyone know, and Juanita, you can't answer this right now, does anyone know where the first blood is spilled in the Bible? I think I do. Being shaken, huh? I think I do. Huh? When God provided those skins for Adam and Eve. Well, that is it. Most people would say, oh, when Cain killed Abel. No. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, it says, The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. That is a very powerful statement. Because it shows that God is painting a picture for mankind. And remember, at this point, as far as we know, there's only been one sin that's occurred. Okay? And God is already showing man how to deal with sin. He is showing him that there needs to be blood shed to deal with his sin. And before he kicked mankind out of the Garden of Eden, God covered man's sin, so to speak. Amen? Mm. Now, Adam may well have thought, even though God has driven us from the Garden of Eden, we know that he loves us, and these garments are a symbol of his love. Okay? Because they are wearing the symbol that God used to cover them. Remember, they tried to cover themselves. They made little aprons of leaves. It wasn't good enough for God. There's, and, and the lesson that's there, and you're going to see that lesson repeated throughout, is there's God's way of doing something, and then there's man's attempt to do it on his own. Okay? They made an apron of leaves, and God said, not good enough, I'm going to cover you. And he did. Now let's look at Genesis 4, verses 1 through 5. Isaac, why don't you have your Bible out so you can read some of these for us. Come on. Genesis 4, verses 1 through 5. Yeah. I said, Isaac. 
And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and his offering he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Thank you. Okay. Now, in this text that Isaac just read to you, Cain and Abel are bringing sacrifices to the Lord. Abel brings a lamb as a sacrifice to God, and Cain brings, brings fruit from the ground. Now, God, as we know from reading later on the text, is pleased with Abel's gift, but he's not pleased with Cain's. Now notice what this account doesn't tell us. It doesn't tell us that there was any difference mentioned between Cain and Abel. Just that Cain was a tiller of the ground and Abel was a shepherd. That's all it really says about it. Abel did not receive any special treatment or education from his parents. But yet, he received the same from his parents as Cain did. And yet Abel brings the blood... In other words, he did it God's way and is accepted because his sacrifice is a lamb. And Cain comes in his own way and is rejected. Perhaps Cain just didn't like blood. Some people don't. Maybe it made him nauseous. It does some people. So he brings the fruit of the ground, the ground that God had cursed when mankind sinned. You cannot bring a cursed offering before God because it's going to be unacceptable. From the time Adam left Eden, there have been Abelites and Cainites. Okay? Abelites come to God by the way of the blood, and the Canaanites come by to the Lord through their own means. And there are many Canaanites in the world today. Men, women who claim to love Messiah, if they try to get to heaven on their own way. They bring their good deeds before God and extol it before God and think that they're going to be accepted. But alas, their fate will be the same as that of Cain. Beware of any man, regardless of who he is, who preaches against the blood of Messiah. And they're doing it. There are people out there that are removing the blood of Messiah from their sermons, they're removing it from their songbooks, they're removing it from their liturgy, because they don't want any part of this bloody religion of Messiah. Because that man is doing Hasatan's work. Even if an angel from heaven appears to you and preaches another gospel, don't listen to him. Messiah died for our sins was the message that the Apostle Paul preached. And that is the gospel, the good news, that God has always honored in the saving of men's lives. Are you an Abelite or are you a Canaanite? Let's look over in Genesis chapter 8. In verse 20, it says, Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt sacrifices on the altar. The flood was over, and what is the first thing that Noah does? He builds an altar and makes a sacrifice, obviously in thanks to the Lord for bringing him through the flood and his family. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 13, 
it tells us that Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket was a ram caught by the horns. He went and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Now this is a very familiar passage to those of us in the Messianic movement. It's called the Akeda. But let's look at the semen for a minute. The altar's been built. The wood has been placed upon it. God even has the sacrifice there in Isaac. So, all, so Abraham gets the sacrifice ready, he <coughs> raises the knife, and he's set to plunge it into the body of his son. But a voice is heard from heaven saying, Abraham, spare your son. And God provided the ram, and we know the story. Centuries later, another son is about to be sacrificed. Let's look at this scene. The cross is in place. The nails have been driven in. The Son is on the cross. The Son is being the sacrifice. And God, just like He watched Abraham almost offer Isaac, is watching this Son be sacrificed. But this time, there is no voice from heaven. There is no cry to spare this Son. Scripture tells us that He gave him up freely. He gave himself up for us freely. The innocent <coughs> for the guilty, the just for the unjust, and aren't we thankful that he did? Amen. We look in Exodus 12. We come to the Passover story. Another story that's very familiar to those of us in this movement. Verse 13 of Exodus 12 says, The blood will be a symbol upon your houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague will not destroy you. Notice, God did not say, When I see your good deeds, how you have prayed and wept and groaned, that I'm going to pass over you. No, God said, when I see the blood. It wasn't their good deeds or their tears or their prayers or their faith that saved them. It was the blood. No doubt, some of the lords and overseers in the land of Egypt that night passed by, by the Israelite homes and saw them sprinkling blood over the doorposts and the lentils and they thought, how foolish these people are. Oh, how this world thinks that the blood of Messiah is foolishness. How they think we fault believers in Messiah are weak and foolish. But later that night, same night, their laughter turned into mourning when the death angel came. When he didn't see that blood, there was weeping and gnashing of teeth and great sorrow. Let this world laugh at you for following Messiah because soon their laughter is going to be turned into sorrow. Leviticus 8, Leviticus 8, verse 23, tells us, And he slew it, and Moses took of the blood and put on the tip of Aaron's right ear, and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the great toe of his right foot. We would call it the big toe, but they call it the great toe. Does this passage of Scripture sometimes seem confusing a little bit? So let's examine it. The tip of the right ear. 
Moses places the blood of the lamb upon Aaron's right ear. It says the tip of his ear. Okay? This signifies that without the blood of the Lamb, and remember who the blood of the Lamb is, it's the blood of Messiah, no man can hear the voice of God and understand and comprehend the voice of God. On Sinai, the people heard the voice of God and it sounded to them like thunder. But when the blood is applied to their ears, I have no problem hearing the voice of God and understanding the voice of God. How's your ear? Has it been anointed with the blood of Messiah? Can you hear the message of the Spirit to you? The thumb of his right hand so he could work for God because what do hands symbolize they symbolize work it's kind of hard enough to, to work if you don't have any hands isn't it Aaron had a holy work that God desired for him to perform and he needed the blood applied to his hands before the work could prosper so many times we try to do a work for God apart from God. And it just doesn't work. We need the anointing of the blood of Messiah upon our hand so that we can do the work of God. The great toe of his right foot so that he can walk with God. God never walked with the Israelites until the blood was sprinkled in the ocean. After that, he walked with them through the very bottom of the Red Sea. When we walk with God, there is nothing that can stand in our way. It was a blood-bought people that God brought into the Promised Land and at the end of this age, this age that we are living in right now, it is going to be a blood-bought blood people that God is going to bring through the Great Tribulation. Mm -hmm. It's a blood-bought church or fellowship that is going to stand before God without spot and without wrinkle. The scripture tells us he's coming back for. Are we part of the blood of the blood bought, the church of the redeemed? Oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood. Amen. The blood of Messiah is precious. The blood of Messiah will save your soul. You know, we see in our day and age religious people who go around shedding other people's blood. The Mormons have their blood atonement doctrine. Of course, the jihadists or beheading people who don't believe the same way that they do. But you know what we have that's so much better than both of those put together? We don't have to shed blood because Messiah shed His blood for us. Amen. And His blood was shed once for all. Hallelujah. He's not going to have to shed it again because it is sufficient. It meets the need. And I don't have to go out there and behead somebody to prove that I love God because God, does, God doesn't need that blood anymore because He has Messiah's blood. Are you covered by the blood? Are your sins forgiven? We need to be blood-bought. We need to be redeemed because if we are not 
we are not going to make it to the end time tribulation period. Amen? All right. That's all I have.